Thank you for having me along to everyone who's organised this. I'm actually up from Canberra this morning. I was now doing some work down there and it just happened to work out quite well with a flight up to here, so I um, managed to come along tonight. Um, the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight are the laws and the associated uh, restrictions that you guys as operators of drones, UAVs, multi-rotors, RPAS devices, UAS, whatever you want to call them, all that kind of stuff that comes into play. Now the laws are operated, or sorry, are developed by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, otherwise known as CASA. The body down in Canberra, they regulate everything to do with aviation. Drones comes under aviation, and that's obviously why we go to them. So what's on the next slide? So, Basically what we're looking at is what they are. Just click through it until they get there. Look at that corner, there we go. Oh, it's, this is gonna happen all night. One more, that'll do. Perfect, unmanned aircraft. Unmanned aircraft are defined by CASA into four different categories. You've got tethered balloons and kites. Unmanned free balloons, which are the weather balloons which uh, the Met Office send up. UAVs and model aircraft. And these two are the areas that we're looking at. UAVs and model aircraft are very interesting because they can be one and the other. Is this a model aircraft or is this a UAV? The only thing that changes it is what you're using it for. Okay. So if you're using that for a commercial operation, it's a UAV. If you're using it for fun, it's a model aircraft. And that poses a lot of problems when we look at the regulations as to what you can do and what you can't do <coughs> as a UAV operator or as a model aircraft operator. So what we don't look at in the regulations is a model aircraft that's operated indoors, an unmanned airship indoors, blimps and those kind of things, if you operate that indoors, a small balloon within 100 metres of a structure, an unmanned tethered balloon and fireworks rocket. Essentially, CASA doesn't care about that. Provided you stay below 400 feet. Now there's a massive discussion uh, about why the 400 feet comes around and there's a couple of people who have done some research out of the University of Adelaide, University of Sydney and UNSW about what actually is this 400 feet. It comes into commingling of airspace which is essentially where a jet aircraft is supposed to be and where a model aircraft is supposed to be and constitutionally CASA doesn't have the authority to dictate anything below 400 feet in certain privileges. We click through on that again. So what is indoors? A flight does not take place indoors if the building in which it uh, is take place has the roof or one or more walls removed. So it's got to be inside of the box. The reason I bring that up is because so many people think oh, I'm under a space frame kind of basketball centre with no walls. Technically that's not indoors. If you're in your garage and you have your door open and you fly a model aircraft within 30 metres of somebody inside your own garage, CASA can come and say, you've done a bad thing and we're going to fine you $500. Close the door, they've got no jurisdiction. It's literally as silly as that. So our focus tonight is going to be model aircraft and UAVs. Model aircraft <coughs> essentially means there's no commercial intent, it's purely as a hobby. And a UAV is a commercial use of an unmanned aircraft. Okay, click through on that one. There's three different UAV types. There's micro, which is zero to 100 grams. And a lot of you are gonna say probably there's not much in the 100 grams kind of category that could really do anything. I can tell you right now that there's some machines out there that are 18 grams and they'll go two and a half kilometers and send a live HD signal back via a satellite back to a bloke on the ground anywhere in the world. 18 grams. If you wanna look it up, it's called a PD100. It's made by a company called Prox Dynamics. Small category from 100 grams to 100 kilos. That is what you guys are probably going to look at. 100 grams to 100 kilos, and then large, 100 kilos and above. There are some UAVs in the commercial kind of industry that we're looking at that are 100 kilos and above. Put five and a half uh, litres of water in a machine and go and do crop spraying with it. Most of those, sorry, 50 litres of water in a machine. Most of those <coughs> things are going to be above 100 kilos. Um, commercial use and intent out there. Uh, Facebook. If you take a photo of one of these things and put it on Facebook, it can be seen as commercial use. Research. If you're doing research with a drone or an unmanned aircraft, it can be seen as commercial use. In fact, there are many precedents around where people in your situation are having to get licenses because CASA has deemed it to be commercial use. Are you doing it as a hobby? No, therefore it's commercial use. It's as simple as that. University of Adelaide, 
is very much fallen into this uh, category, Dr. Liam Pinko down there, and Dr. Arco Lucia down at UTAS in Tasmania, two uh, researchers in the drone field that are very much into research but are fully licensed. Promotion of a business product or service. Very interesting case a couple of weeks ago came to law where a gentleman who built a garage for his mate decided to take a photo with a drone, put it on Facebook, Casa find him. Okay? He had no you know, intent of saying, oh, I build garages or anything like that, but Casa find him. If you take photography and distribute it to other persons, that one's a pretty uh, simple one. And the key one is anything other than a hobby. If you're not doing it as a hobby, it's probably commercial. Go through from there. Will that one? Just, yeah, go back. There's a lot of restrictions as to what we're looking at. You've got to have a license. A person may operate a UAV for higher reward only if the person holds a UAV operator certificate. These things here in red, that's actually the regulation, Civil Aviation Safety Regulation. It's a book about that thick, and it all comes under part 101, and that's point two seven zero. So you've got to have a license to operate a UAV. Next one. You can't operate in prohibited or restricted airspace unless you've got permission. Simple as that. Is it hard to get permission? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Operations in controlled airspace. Now, a lot of you probably won't understand the aviation term for what controlled airspace is. There's about five different categories of airspace in the world. There's about four in Australia. Controlled airspace is anything other than a type of airspace called Class G airspace. If you have anything other than Class G airspace, there'll be somebody on the other end of a radio telling you what to do in that airspace. You can operate in controlled airspace without telling anyone, provided you stay below 400 feet. And that comes back to the commingling of airspace issue. So if you're below 400 feet, you can pretty much say it's safe to do what you want to do. Okay. Approved areas for operation. So if you need to go and do a job somewhere, unmanned aircraft or rockets can apply to CASA for approval of an area for the operation of these things. Now, a lot of guys do this when they want to do a research assignment. We've done it uh, recently along the rabbit proof fence for about 150 kilometres, and we told Castle we're going to go there and fly drones. They said, fine, you can go 1,000 feet high. The rule previous said we could only go 400 feet high, but if Castle gives you permission, you can almost do what you like. Okay. Operation near an aerodrome. Now, this is a very contentious topic at the moment. A person may operate an unmanned aircraft at an altitude above 400 feet within three nautical miles of an aerodrome only if the operation is permitted by another provision of this part or permission has been given for the operation under that regulation. And that regulation basically says that you have to get permission from CASA. The key point there is to note that it says above 400 feet. There's technically nothing in the rules stopping you operating below 400 feet within three nautical miles of an aerodrome. Would I do it? No. Because there's another rule that King, uh, kicks into place, which might be on the next slide. No, back one. No, it's, it's we'll worry about that one later. Uh, no, I'll find it for you. Might not even be in here. No. It's not in there, but there's a regulation, 101.055, and it says a hazardous operation. If you do anything that's hazardous to an aircraft, they will come and pin you. Simple as that. <coughs> okay. From there, weather and day limitations. You can only operate at night in conditions other than VMC. VMC means visual meteorological conditions. If you can't see it, it's not visual. Or uh, into cloud, it's at the top there, but that's formatted incorrectly. Note down the bottom, model aircraft can operate at night in accordance with the Model Aeronautical Association rules. So if you're doing it as a hobby, you are able to operate at night. Have I confused everyone yet? Because I get confused about this stuff. And these are the rules. Yeah, CASA gets confused about this stuff. Where small UAVs may be operated at. The person may operate a small UAV outside an approved area, only where the UAV is operated above 400 feet, the operator has CASA approval, and the UAV stays clear of a populous area. CASA threw that word populous area in there and nobody knows what it means, so they went, fine, we'll make another regulation and just simply define what a populous area is. 
And they said, for this part, an area is a populous area in relation to the operation of an unmanned aircraft or rocket. If the area has a sufficient density of population for some aspect of the operation or some event that might happen during the operation, in particular a fault in or failure of the aircraft or rocket, to pose an unreasonable risk to the life, safety or property of someone who is in the area but is not connected with the operation. And there's two words in that which stuff everything up. Anyone have a guess of what those two words are? Sufficient and unreasonable. These two. Unreasonable risk. What's an unreasonable risk? And therefore, what's a reasonable risk? So how do we stay clear of a populous area when we simply don't understand it? And this has never been tried in law. Nobody's been taken to court over it yet because they don't know how to apply it. But we think of some examples. I have this thing here, DJI Inspire 1. It's around about three and a half kilos. I'm flying at 400 feet high. Overhead, a music festival. It says there, some event that might happen during the operation, in particular, a failure or fault in the aircraft or the rocket. These things have a tendency to lose propeller blades very quickly like that. This thing will not fly with three. What happens? Call it stall, spin, crash, burn, die in, the, in those, that order. It'll literally flip on its head and uh, go straight down into the crowd of people. So if something goes wrong, is that an unreasonable risk? Simply, yes. But if we think about it, that they're now under a building or inside a tent, what's going to happen when this thing falls? It's probably not going to go through the tent. It'll stay on the roof of the tent. So is that a reasonable risk? It's a very grey area of the regulations. But these are the things that if you guys are going to start developing these things and understanding them, this is what you're going to get into. Operation near people, quite simple. <coughs> Don't go within 30 metres of people. Okay. UAV control restrictions. It's not what they do. I don't know. I think the cable moved. How's that? Oh, that's all good. There we go. UAV controller restrictions. Conditions on certification as a UAV <coughs> controller. So, without limiting other regulations, CASA can allow the person to control UAVs of only specific kinds. So if they give you a licence, they can say it's only a licence for a two-wheel drive car, not a four-wheel drive car. Ideas like that. Limit the areas where he or she may control UAVs or allow him or her to control UAVs only in visual meteorological conditions. Quite confusing, but the ones that they look at is this limit the area where he or she may control UAVs. Remember previously we said that if you were below 400 feet you could operate within three nautical miles of an aerodrome. Every single licence that CASA <coughs> issues will have this restriction on it. And it's issued in accordance with that regulation. And that says an authorised UAV must not be flown at any altitude within three nautical miles of the movement area of an aerodrome, or flies landing area, or helicopter landing site, this and in Ursa, or is designated by Air Services Australia, unless the operator obtains the written permission of CASA. So, you guys are model operators. Are you doing a commercial task or a non-commercial task? Do you need a law and now you need to figure do, do you need a license, sorry? Now you need to figure out where you can or can't operate. Anyone see how confusing this is becoming? And this is in the first five minutes. So the trick is, in model aircraft, there's no additional restrictions to that contained in CASA 101. So this page here doesn't apply. So here comes the massive conundrum. I'm a fully certified pilot. I teach people how to use UAVs. I certify people with UAVs. And I do a heck of a lot of training with UAVs. If I take one of these, I can't go and fly within three nautical miles of Brisbane Airport. Find a 12 year old off the street, goes and buys one of these from a hobby shop, nothing stopping me. What do you think I'm looking out the window for when I'm getting close to an airport in a big jet? These things. So, the licensing, which is probably what you guys are looking at. You need two things. You need a control certificate, which is your licence. And you also need an unmanned operator certificate, which is the company licence. 
So I think of it as Qantas and a pilot. The pilot who works for Qantas needs a license. Qantas also needs a license to be an airline. It's the same set of rules that operate under this. So the, the license that you're after is called a control certificate. The license that the company needs is an unmanned operator certificate, or UOC. In an aviation term for an airline, it's actually called an AOC, airline operator certificate. How hard are they, they to get? Control certificates relatively easy. There's a couple of things that you say um, that it says that you have to do, and it's things like five hours experience operating UAVs outside of controlled airspace. Qualifies for the issue of a radio operator certificate. So if you've got a radio operator certificate, you're good to go. Has been awarded a pass in initial rating theory examination, but they'll give you an exemption against that. Has been awarded a pass in an aviation license theory examination, other than a flight radio operator's examination. Has anyone heard of a PPL theory exam? Private pilot's license. Have you done one? Anyone doing one? You've done one? I'm doing it now. You're doing it now. When you finish it, you've got one of these licenses as well. Okay. He still needs the five hours though. He still needs the five hours experience operating UAVs. So if you grab a fire UAV and go and fly it around with a logbook, you'll have a UAV license. Not very hard to get. For those of you who don't want to go down the pilot's license uh, route, all you need to do is do an RPAS course. Problem is it's expensive. Around about three and a half thousand dollars. But then you get a drone license. What I suggest is hold off for a little while because TAFE will start offering these kind of courses and you'll see them filtering through the universities. Okay. Other than that, there are some exemptions and this is the exemption that I was talking about for your case. <coughs> uh, a person who holds a flight crew license with an instrument rating or a military qualification or an air traffic control license does not require to complete two A, B and C. Okay. For a UOC, so this is what your company needs. Your company needs an organisational structure. <coughs> your company needs a person who is qualified to complete the tasks. If necessary, the flight crew must also hold radio operator certificates, which aren't very hard to get. And the person has to be nominated, has to nominate suitable persons to be chief controller and maintenance controller. You need to be able to look after these UAVs in a maintenance sense and you also need to operate the UAVs in a control and operation sense.